Hey team, chemistry coach coming at you, moving further along our journey through our introduction to matter. So we classified matter last time, briefly introduced you to elements, you know, part of the pure substances, elements and compounds, uh, and then different types of mixtures. Of course, we're going to get into great detail in compounds uh, on one of our later journeys, but I just want to briefly overview the elements today. The elements! Oh, look at all my acid holes in my shirt. Ha ha ha. You know you're a true chemist when you have lots of acid hole burns in your clothing. Don't wear nice clothes to lab, my friends. <laughs> I might end up like that. <laughs> but always have a periodic table around with you. We'll go into the details of the periodic table uh, later in one of our later journeys. I just want to introduce, you know, you've probably already been through all this in high school or introductory chemistry or maybe just for fun. Um, but let's just kind of review the elements, uh, the element symbols we use for them. Maybe a little history into it if we have some time. I love that stuff. Some of them have just the weirdest symbols. You know, why sodium Na not applicable? No, no, no. It's <laughs> capital N, little a, not capital N, capital A. Um, this is what we covered uh, in the classification of matter video. So I just wanted to stick that back up there. Just think of them as the basic building blocks of matter. I think of it almost like an alphabet. If you want to speak a language, right? You can't you can't start you know writing or speaking paragraphs or sentences uh, unless you know the alphabet. You got to be able to put words together. So think of the elements, right? All these babies on the old periodic table. Woo woo woo. Depending which version you have. I have 118 now with Oganesson way over here. Boom. So a lot of these were just recently um, formalized in the last couple of years. Really cool ones. So always have a copy of the periodic table with you. And think of them as letters. And then what we're going to do is once we're comfortable with the letters, then we can put them together to make words. And that's what's going to be compounds later. So we'll have a whole video just on compounds, how to write them, how to name them. And remember, compounds, the elements combine in very specific ratios. So we got to figure out what those ratios are using subscripts. And then once we have words, then we can put those together to make sentences. And that's what we call chemical equations, which we'll look on later on. So you can kind of see it's almost learning chemistry is almost like learning a language. It's almost identical. So there's our alphabet. In my personal class, you will not have to memorize these. This is the periodic table I will provide you on exams and quizzes. And it has the, uh, the element uh, symbol and the name. And I'll do a blow up of that to show you what all those numbers and things mean and what we're going to look to in the future. So just this is an introductory video. Now remember last time we looked at uh, elements can exist as atoms or molecules, and a molecule being two or more atoms connected together chemically. So the ones that exist with individual atoms, think like a box, pour some marbles in the box. Boom, there you go. Probably the easiest way to look at it, or, or if you're at a, uh, a store, um, you, the way they stack oranges or apples sometimes, the way they stack the oranges, the little holes in between them, that's almost on an atomic level how some elements exist. So we'll call those monatomic elements. That's the majority of them. Don't even try to memorize all of those. And then there's the polyatomic ones that exist as molecules. The most common ones we're going to deal with are the diatomic ones. We covered these last time. I just want to include the states this time. Uh, and there's some that are, like I said, phosphorus, sometimes you'll see as P4. Sulfur, sometimes as S sub 8. Uh, even carbon, you might see as C sub 60 sometimes. Uh, you get some crazy things going on. Uh, but we'll just stick with these diatomic ones. They're the only ones you need to know. But have these memorized. It's very important. So, and if you go with the Brinkelhoff, I still can't remember where, where I heard that from. But you've got the bromine, which happens to be a liquid. And these are at room temperature and atmospheric pressure, sea level. Iodine is a solid. That's what I showed you in one of the videos. That sublime, so that really beautiful purple, um, uh, purple gas. One of my favorite elements of all time. Nitrogen is a gas. Chlorine is that green toxic gas. Nitrogen, of course, you're breathing all the time. It's like 78% of the atmosphere. <sighs> breathing deeply, my friends. Lots of nitrogen. Um, so hopefully you don't do that with chlorine because yeah, that would be a really bad day for you. <laughs> all right. Hydrogen gas, of course, you know, a flammable. Boom, boom. Think Hindenburg. Oxygen gas. <sighs> breathing deeply. About 21% of that was oxygen. So almost the entire atmosphere is just nitrogen and oxygen. And we'll talk about why when we look at Lewis structures way down in another journey. And then fluorine, of course. So Brinkelhoff. 
Oh, I still think of it as the Magnificent Seven. So what I want to do is blow up one of these boxes on this periodic table, right? Just blow it up there. Not actually blow it up like chemists like to do, um, but make it bigger. <laughs> like on your screen, you go, whoa, make it bigger. Make it bigger. Doesn't work on mine. I don't want to touch my screen. It might delete the video. <laughs> and show you what all those numbers mean and where we're going kind of in introduction to uh, your near future. And then talk about some of the cool elements and notations. Be right back. Let's take a look at these little boxes here. You ready? And we're going to hit this periodic table pretty hard later on down the road. So I just picked one of them. I just picked lead just to give you some of the uh, terminology and where we're headed. So you'll see four, at least on my periodic table, four pieces of information. Of course, the element symbol, and we're going to explain, you know, where does PB come from for lead? There's no P in lead or B. Kind of weird. So we get some, you know, Greek Latin stuff going on here. And it's kind of a fun history. I'll do a little snippet of it because I, I love it, but we just don't have time to go into the great detail of the history of where the names come from. So we got the element symbol. Now, Whenever you have an element symbol, it's going to have one or two letters. If it has one letter, like your hydrogen, your carbon, your oxygen, your nitrogen, that's always capitalized. Always, always, always. If you have two letters, the first one's always capitalized. The second one has to be lower cased. Has to be. Otherwise, you might run into a situation like this. Watch. Let's say you're a little sloppy. You got capital C, little O, capital C, capital O. Two totally different things. That's cobalt, the element cobalt. That's a compound, carbon monoxide, right? So if you are off or sloppy or it's not clear in your writing, that could be very, 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 very confusing for people, right? So we don't want to make that mistake. Be very crystal clear. Chemists are all about being crystal clear. No assumptions made by anybody. Everybody knows what we mean. And then, of course, I put the element name down below it. And if you don't see an association between the name and the symbol, then there's probably some Greek, Latin, uh, you know, German, Indo-European, some kind of history to it through the languages, and it kind of morphs over time. I'm listening to a CD now because I drive, you know, four hours a day, almost three to four hours a day, and I love these CDs, books on CD. So I'm listening to one on languages, um, and and uh, it goes through a lot of the history of how words come from. You don't even think about it, right? It's like, wow, where did that word come from? And it goes through the history of how it morphed over the ages. So much fun. Learning is so cool. All right. That number on top we're going to look at later in another one of our journeys. That's called the atomic number. And that's given a symbol Z. We'll find out that's the number of protons, which is a subatomic particle. And we're, we'll go through the discovery of protons and, and all that fun stuff. Um, but we number it based on the number of uh, protons. So you got one that proton, two, two protons, three protons, four. So this is organized based on the atomic number. It was originally by mass, which is on the bottom. So you got atomic mass on the bottom, and there's a whole video on how we calculate those numbers. You're going to run into an issue on isotopes. Uh, and this is actually an average number over a bunch of different what are called isotopes uh, of that particular element. So this is an exact number here. It's a number of particles. This is not an exact number. That is uh, a calculated value. So symbol, name, atomic number, and atomic mass. Boom! And remember, if you got uh, always capitalize the first letter and always lowercase the second. Let's look at some of those Latin, Greek, weird historical things. So if you look at the periodic table, you notice most element names match, right? You got Oxygen for O, nitrogen for N, carbon for C, B for boron, F for fluorine, N for neon. They make complete total sense. But there's some weird ones, all right? And a lot of them have really interesting, I mean, you can kind of tell where they come from. So if you look at something like AM, americium, I wonder where that's from. You know, uh, Curium, anybody heard of Marie Curie, right? BK, Berkelium, I wonder where that one's from. Californiums, sounds like uh, several elements were uh, synthesized at Berkeley. Pretty much a lot of these after uranium, brrr, these transuranium elements, they're not natural. 
A lot of them were created at Berkeley. Some of the newer ones, uh, Dubnium from, uh, so there's a Russian place, a place in Tennessee and a place in Russia that did a lot of these later ones. So you'll get some of these later ones. You'll get uh, Tennessee, right? Tennessee there. Um, Japan, I think. Uh, had some impact on that. So some. So usually it's from an origin, either after a person, some of the newer ones after a person or a location, something like that. But a lot of the older ones, um, uh, one of my favorites, I like uh, Niobium and Tantalum. Niobium and Tantalum, I think that comes from some kind of Greek stuff, or it's like one's a daughter of another, some Greek story. It's, it's fascinating. I wish I, I can't remember it off the top of my head. You read about these things, and you never write them down. I probably should. But let's look at the ones that I think tie up some students where they don't make sense. Um, a lot of the coinage metals, uh, copper, uh, we know copper pennies or cents technically now, but uh, for most of modern human history, silver and gold uh, were what the coins were made out of. And, and, you know, paper money is only kind of a recent invention that we use. Um, so you get silver, gold, and copper, a lot of these coinage metals. So silver has a symbol AG. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it comes from a kind of an Indo-European uh, blend, uh, Argentum, right? So you can see where the AG comes from there. Uh, mercury, uh, HG, which is not a coinage metal per se, but uh, Hydra Argyrum. I don't know if I pronounced that right. That's a mixture. You can see where the HG comes from. It's a kind of a Greek Latin blend for liquid silver. Because if you ever seen mercury, it looks like molten silver. It's really neat. It's fun to play with. Even the old uh, old thermometers, right? We have these thermometers now. We use this kind of an alcohol like solution. But the good old ones back in the day had mercury in there. One of the two elements that are liquids at room temperature: bromine and mercury. Uh, so Greek Latin for liquid silver, or some people call it quicksilver. Right? Not the quicksilver you're thinking from uh, certain movies. <laughs> with his face going backwards. Um, you might actually recognize, so that is an old coin. That's an old dime. I don't know if you can see, that looks like, uh, I think it was uh, one of the old gods, Mercury, right? A speed type of stuff. It's actually Lady Liberty with a uh, winged helmet, but uh, coin collectors or numismatists call that uh, a Mercury dime or a Merc right? Mercury dime. So kind of neat. So from like 1960 to, you know, World War One, World War II-ish, 1916 to 1944, I think, 45. And these used to be made of silver, actually, right? Coins up to 1964, dimes, nickel, not nickels, uh, dimes, uh, half dollars and quarter dollars were actually made like 90% silver up to 64. And then they took the silver out, which is too bad. You won't find these in circulation. So that's actually about 90% silver right there, which is pretty neat. And that's called a Merc. That's what dimes used to look like probably in a lot of your parents' or grandparents' days. Sweet, huh? Uh, gold, of course. Well, I don't have uh, I don't have any gold on me. <laughs> it's expensive. Aurum, Latin for yellow, I think. Maybe sounds from dawn or something like that. Uh, copper, CU, comes from cuprum, kind of a Greek. I think uh, there was some, a lot of copper from Cyprus, the island of Cyprus. So that may be a, a morphed uh, historical word for Cyprus that comes down. Now, I don't know if you've seen silver. Uh, so this is a modern quarter, right? Modern quarter right there. This is what quarters used to look like. See that? So this is from 1964, I believe, the last year that uh, coins were actually made of 90% silver. Can you see the difference there? Look how shiny the silver is. Man, coins used to look really good now. Now that all the silver was taken out, oh, they debased our coinage. No fun at all. Let's list a few more up there because I just, I find this stuff interesting. Maybe you don't. You can just fast forward through this. That's okay. Here's a few more to tickle the fancies of the people who like historical stuff. Sodium, potassium, two of the most common ones we're going to be using. Um, the Na comes from natrium, right? Latin uh, ends up deriving, I think, from sodium carbonate back in the day. And potassium is from callium. You can see where the K and the N-A come from. Uh, Latin, I think that derived from an Arabic term for when you burn plants and the ash left over. It's like plants contain uh, a lot of uh, potassium in there. Was it potassium? What are the three elements when you buy that food for plants? Potassium, nitrogen, and phosphorus? Don't quote me on that one. But anyway, you burn up the plant, you can get extract potassium from it. Um, so callium derived from that. 
Tungsten, another one of my favorite elements. Think light bulb filaments. W, I read a whole book, Uncle Tungsten. It's fascinating, by the way. Uh, it's a German one, Wolfram, right? From the mineral uh, Wolframite. I think it actually, it's like a side product from uh, some mining or whatever. It means like uh, wolf, wolf foam or something like that coming from, I don't know, because it comes out. I, I need to read more of my history. Uh, iron, of course, a very popular one throughout. We had a whole age, iron age on that one. Uh, ferrum. You can see where the F-E comes from. Uh, Latin for iron or swords, right? When they started making, going from bronze to iron and then to steel, you can see the different ages uh, going through. Kind of cool. Uh, let's do a couple more and uh, we'll be done with this. Just a couple more to, you know, get your blood going or whatever. Tin and lead are, are a couple of common ones we get into right over here, right? If you look on your periodic table, you see tin and lead right next to each other. Boom, 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 boom. With the weird symbols. So tin is Latin stanum. Uh, I've seen some varying stories of where that stems from. Yeah, I couldn't tell you which one. Uh, maybe from an Indo-European uh, word for stag or because like a, a dripping because um, uh, tin has a really low melting point, so it, you know you heat it up, and drips out. So it might stem from that, or possibly Cornwall. Uh, I guess is famous. I haven't read the history of it myself. Famous for its tin mines and steen. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, comes from the, the Cornish stuff there. Oh well, take it for what it is. Uh, lead plumum. That's where the PB comes from, and that may ring some familiarity if you're into fishing with plumb lines, right? Little lead things if you go fishing. Uh, or plumbers, right? You call a plumber. I just had a plumber come over a couple times, man. Ooh, can get expensive. Because um, a lot of the ancient pipes, uh, especially Roman uh, pipes, were made of lead. Okay? So it's uh, gotten a, a you know, Latin derivation of that, but uh, some English words have uh, uh, come from that. And then last but not least, antimony, SB, from stibium. Uh, I... I'm not much into Greek history. There's just not enough. I mean, you need to be immortal to read all this stuff. But I think they used antimony in some of their paints and eye colors and things like that. Um, so this is kind of a Greek derivation for eye paint or eye color, uh, stibium. Interesting stuff. I haven't done a tremendous amount of uh, historical research on it. Just a couple little things here and there. But it's just interesting to see where the symbols come from. Um, that don't match the name. So anyway, that's a little intro to elements for you. Take it or leave it. Not critical. Um, and let's move on to some uh, properties of matter.